Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% Centre show about women reshaping our world coming up. Two years on after playing a key role in the Sudanese revolution, women in the country are still struggling to change attitudes in the highly conservative Muslim society. Also, with the African Union having made equality one of its top priorities, I'll be talking to Benetta Diop, the organisation's special envoy on women, peace and security about the difficulties in seeking parity. And a woman found by a French court to have violated her marital duty by refusing to have sex with her husband has taken her case to the European Court of Human Rights. But we begin in Sudan, where two years ago, the image of this young female student supporting protests went viral. Those mass rallies led to the ousting of the country's then autocratic leader, Omar al-Bashir. While women were at the heart of the protest in 2019, the reality is that despite their demands at the time for greater respect and equality, there is still a long way to go. Our team on the ground sent us this report. For many, this would be a normal start to the day. But for Ines, riding a bike as a woman is a militant move. In 2019, the law on moral and public order, which dictated women's daily life, was abolished, but social pressure still weighs heavily. It's possible to do it to, with the trousers, to wear uh, outfits, even the sport ones, but uh, socially it's still an issue. So we, when we go to a certain places, like the public zones and the places where people are traditional, you can, we cannot wear the, the same things we do it here in the center of Khartoum. In this sports park, there are very few women. When Inas meets one, they begin to chat. She wants to join. Yeah, of course. She said she's going to call me later. <laughs> Some progress has been made these past months. The prohibition of genital mutilation, for example. But women are still facing many obstacles. Wad Bahajat is at the center of a controversial trial. She meets with Anas to receive some advice. <laughs> Wad was harassed at a gas station by a policeman on November 8th. She resisted and live-streamed a video, but her defiance angered the policeman who arrested her. She now faces one possible year in prison for aggression and disruption of public order. When this incident occurred, I didn't imagine that these things could still happen today, after the revolution. We don't have uh, uh, like a commission for women's rights. Uh, we don't have like uh, clear um, uh, laws and legislation legislations that support women's rights. Because of all that, these things happen, and men are not afraid. When al-Bashir was in power, activists were already fighting for their rights. Isan Fagiri was imprisoned multiple times. Today she's being awarded a prize for her actions, but she feels the prime minister is not doing enough. We need from him to be more quick, more decisive. It is not just to put two, three women in your office or for what. You need women activists who are feeling that there is a problem, women problem. Like others, Isan Fagiri is asking for more inclusiveness in the government and in the administration. Following a period of high hopes two years after the revolution, disappointment now seems to be the shared feeling among Sudanese women. Now, as COVID-19 continues to turn the world upside down, it's also heightened inequalities within society, and none more so than between women and men. The African Union, which includes 55 member states, has made equality one of its top priorities. Yet, as is the case in other parts of the world, it's still far from reaching parity. Joining me now from Geneva is Benetta Diop, the African Union's Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security. Thank you so much for your time. What, in your opinion, are the major obstacles in achieving equality, especially in Africa, where so many communities subscribe to a conservative and highly traditional view about the role of women? Um, thank you very much, um, um, Annette. Uh, let me just recall that we have a parity principle adopted by the African Union, which makes that we have on top uh, of the leadership, uh, you know, uh, men and women uh, equal and in all the organs. But yet, uh, you talk about it, there is uh, discrimination in a very uh, patriarchal system 
that exists in uh, in Africa. So discrimination against women is a uh, the gender-based violence, but so many other phenomena that uh, we know, uh, which are based on culture and tradition, female genital mutilation, you name them, um, you know, uh, uh, early marriage also, um, and so many in conflict zone, uh, rape being used uh, as a weapon of war. So we have those phenomena, and we always say that we need to work at the ground level to change the attitude and the mindset. So we have the right laws at the AU, like uh, the protocol on human rights, women's rights. We have solemn declaration. We have so many instruments, but now we need to trickle down those instruments, implement them, and it's time for action. 25 years after Beijing, time for action in terms of fighting against gender discrimination. How hard is it for you, Benetta, to do your job, to convince African governments to reaffirm the role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts? You know, uh, when the UN Resolution 1325 was created, the majority of Security Council were men. Uh, but we need, that's why we need the men. Uh, we know that, um, you know, uh, it was in a context where um, conflict, we saw rape, we saw so many phenomena but women had to bring their human face. And in that we had not just to have the men with the muscle, with the forces, but what we need to resolve our conflict is also to bring the human dimension, is a, another paradigm shift, is to bring the women with the human security um, agenda, which deal with how do we deal with the education of a country, the economy of the country, natural resources, the health system, et cetera. So when they sit at the table, this is what women bring. But we cannot do it without the men. And I can say that uh, a society that discriminates the women is a society that will not evolve So or transform. That's why women and men have to work hand in hand. Now, COVID-19 has overturned decades of progress in women's rights. What impact has it had in your particular field? Uh, let me just say that before COVID, and I was reading a World Bank report, they said that Africa was doing good in certain areas like education of girls and so on. But COVID-19 have come with the impact, huge impact on women. Who are the front workers, frontline workers, the health workers, the women, majority are women. Um, who are taking care of the children for the education at home, the women. Um, who are in the in the refugee camps and majority are the women. So if we need to rebuild back better, we need to put the women at the center. We need to and to provide them the uh, the testing, but also the vaccine. So give access to women in the response should be a priority. So we will make a better world, and I think that's where we need to concentrate our efforts on women in responding to COVID-19. Just finally, Benetta, in 2018, the African Union acknowledged that sexual harassment was widespread within the organisation. Do you think it will be possible to reach zero tolerance in the years ahead? Um, I think that uh, the African Union, knowing what is happening in um, every place in the world, because even COVID-19 have shown the sexual and gender-based violence is everywhere. It's not just an African problem, it's everybody's problem. So what we did was to put a, a policy, sexual harassment policy, uh, as well a code of conduct. But again, we need to make sure that whatever the African Union uh, put as a policy, the implementation is at national level. And we need to work with our member states to implement and take action and fight against impunity, but also restore the dignity of the women, of the survivors, of those who have been, uh, you know, exposed uh, to violence. So the AU is following it. My, my office as a special envoy is, have put clear indicators to make sure that we measure progress in the field. And this is one of the elements that we are bringing to support our member state in delivering to their commitment. Benetta Diop, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And finally, a woman found by a French court to have violated her marital duty has brought her case to the European Court of Human Rights. The French court having said she was to blame for her failed marriage because she refused to have sex with her husband. A ruling upheld by the country's top appeals court in 2020. The woman said her refusal was due to a poor state of health and her husband's violent behaviour. Delana D'Souza reports. A woman who lost her divorce case in a French court is appealing to the European Court of Human Rights. She's deemed to have violated her marital duty by refusing to have sex with her husband. The notion of conjugal duty no longer exists in French law. The country's civil code says mutual help, respect, fidelity and a communal life are marital musts. But the legislation never specifies that a shared lifestyle should include conjugal relations. One expert says courts tend to interpret this wording through traditional values rooted in religious history. This is an interpretation of shared lifestyle as being both a shared bed and a shared roof that judges have consistently made since 1804. In reality, this lingering vision has its roots in the religious origins of civil marriage. This case has precedence. In 2011, a man was convicted for not respecting his conjugal duty. Among a list of similar divorce cases brought to court by both husbands and wives, 11 have led to a conviction. Feminist groups believe the legal wording should be changed. They argue that to avoid a legal offence by abstaining from sex, a spouse would need to have non-consensual relations. To say that sexual relations between a husband and a wife are compulsory is to make conjugal rape legal. So it goes against all the new legislation that says that marital rape exists. And this was complicated to achieve. And it even creates an enabling circumstance. France could be obliged to change its legislation depending on which way the European Court of Human Rights decides to rule. And that's it for now. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.